fairly new practice for us doing this through doing our things through Zoom here. Um, but I don't see how to do the polling, so we can do for it. For the first yeah. little while, uh, for the next little while, looks like this is how we'll be doing it. So you're going to, you might see some growing pains and some practice pains and, and fumbles along the way, but uh, welcome. I uh, we don't have any audio input from the audience. Is that correct? Right. People can raise their hands or some give a, a indication in chat if they have questions. And I've got a question right now, which is just a technicality. And uh, Irena Lumen asks, is there a video? Uh, you should be able to see the several of us who are panelists here or hosts of the meeting. And Richard Miller acknowledges we can chat. So you can chat at all panelists or you can chat at all panelists and all attendees, which you might want to do, Richard. So shall we do our bit of Bake High business while we're checking out whether the YouTube is going to work? Yeah, and I think Edwin's doing that. Right. And do we have, do we know whether uh, we have the capability in the uh, raising of hands? Yeah, but do we have the order to thing? do I, I... I don't seem to be able to do it as co-host. So I think we're going to go away. We're just going to have, if there, if you're a new member, if you're new to this, never been here before, just, just chat new. And if you've been here many times, <laughs> just, just chat um, many times. And we'll record them that way. Okay. Uh, seeing messages from folks who are seeing black screens, maybe not necessarily. There's one person for sure who's seeing a black screen. Mm -hmm. I see a black screen on YouTube, even though it is streaming. So I'm still, I don't, I don't quite know what to do about that. Yeah, okay, as long as you know that. All right. Well, we have the YouTube. We have this. We have the. We have one version of the recording going on. So <laughs> let's just. It's amazing. It is amazing. So, uh, Edwin, do you want to continue? Uh, sure. So. We're, I was looking at um, so just, Nancy, if we, if we, are we count, what are we doing tonight, you know? Yes, if we can count uh, based on raised hands, sure. we can do that. We can do our uh, elections using that as our mechanism. Good. Okay. Is that tr true? All right. So you won't get it from any of us who are showing. We don't have the raised hands. We have to add ourselves separately. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, then. Let's do. Let's, let's see. present the slate of candidates. All right. So we have three. We have three offices for which we do elections each year, and that is chair, vice chair and treasurer. Um, we'll do. And between those for treasurer, I believe we have Roberta. Is it? Let's do. Let's do treasurer first. We have one candidate for treasurer. And um, looking for my little tab with that information. Uh, we have, I have a last name here. Uh, Roberta Bern Bernhardt. Bernhardt, all right. Who has previously on served on the membership team and uh, is now, who has spent some time away and is now back in the Bay Area. Uh, do we want to have statements by the candidates themselves? Brief, very brief, you think? Do we have the sure. facility to sorry, find Aaron. the right people? Quickly yes, enough? we can, uh, oops, sorry. That wasn't who I meant. Roberta is now being unmuted. Okay, great. Hey, Roberta. Hey, everyone. Now, this is Roberta. So um, I'm happy to be back in the Bay Area. I was working the past 10 years in DC, working at the national level for uh, air transport management um, and capability. And so I'm back here working virtually. I'm happy to be here. I also have 10 years experience in the international financial world, having worked in Geneva and for large companies such as Capital International and Franklin Templeton. Um, not only really sure what else to say, but we'd really like to be able to support Bakai and uh, we'll take care of the finances and be prompt with responsibilities of treasurer and whatever um, you may need for me to do. So um, not much. Else. Thank you. Unless you have any questions. 
I think that's fine. Thank you. And there All are right. two other elected offices. What are they, Edwin? Uh, let's see. The, the other two elected offices are chair and vice chair. Uh, I've been serving as the chair for a couple of years. And uh, I think, let's see, in conversations with Ted, um, I think this time up, I will be uh, offering myself up as a candidate for vice chair. Uh, so I will be, I guess I think, I believe I am the only candidate for that. So I can go ahead and with that, um, we are, we've got a lot of little projects though, <laughs> some big projects that need movement. And um, I think carrying forward from existing officerships is perhaps the best way to at least keep them on the table, on the radar and having seen some of the uh, challenges in them, the best way to perhaps push them forward. In that regard, uh, while I may not have quite the focus that I would like for, uh, for a chair person, I'm happy to take the vice chair position. So that's where I'm at. Thank you. Continuity, yeah. <laughs> uh, so our third elected office is chair and for that we have a candidate uh, Ted Selker who has served two terms now as vice chair so um, I'm away. yeah I'm Ted Selker and I want to say that over the last month and a half I've reached out to the people that I know to ask for people that wanted to nominate themselves to be part of the of the officers and we continue to be interested in bringing in other people so if you'd feel this is um, uh, too, too, too much, we're doing the same thing for each other, it's not that we'd need, we want to. We're, we're happy to, to share, share the leadership. And um, quite frankly, uh, I, I wanna make this uh, more of an organization that's participatory. Uh, we wanna stop calling people volunteers and call them experience creators. So we'll be the Beikai experience creators. And uh, if I'm elected, uh, one of the first things I wanna do is put on a party um, like this, uh, but better. I mean, more of a party um, uh, on July 11th. So um, that's that's my little my little thing. And and we're going to be doing. Uh, I think we're going to update our uh, way of being online a little bit this year. Um, and I think that we're going to. Um, we have been Nancy and I as program chairs um, um, have been really um, changing. I think the quality of these uh, talks. We've been having very very uh, good response to our headliners over the last several months. Uh, we were running 20 people a meeting. Now we're running more like 90. Um, so we're happy about that. And it's, uh, that happened before COVID also, by the way. Um, so that's all I have to say. Um, maybe now, uh, what do we do to ratify this or-, or um, So now I'll, I'll pretend I'm the elections coordinator. How about that? The election <laughs> coordinator. And so I will invite anyone who is attending this meeting and who is a Beikai member to uh, indicate their support for the slate of officers by raising their hands. And so uh, that means, at least I'm seeing a lot of raised hands here, that's great. Okay, and I'm assuming the people who are not raising their hands are not current Beikai members, but you could be, you know where our membership is $20 a year, pretty easy. Okay, we have 12 raised hands here. I think that's at least a quorum. We're going to, uh, and Edwin and yes, and me. Uh, so we're gonna declare the election a success and we are very excited to have, oh, and then we have some yeah, abstentions as well. We're very happy to have a new slate of officers, a new uh, rearrangement and additions to our officers. And let's get on with the evening's events. So I'm, I'm gonna take a moment just to introduce my good friend, Aaron Marcus. Aaron has uh, brought many, many good things to the human computer interaction field, starting very, very, very early um, before any of us were born. Uh, he was already bringing graphic design to um, uh, user-friendly interfaces, uh, as we used to call them. And uh, he also worked in VR uh, back in the very early 70s. Many, many things you see on his on his bio, I'm sure. 
but um, he often speaks about different things. And in fact, one day I ran into him about a year and a half ago and he told me he was publishing six books that year. So who knows uh, if we can read all his books um, in, in our lifetime. But anyway, um, I think um, it's very exciting to have Aaron talking tonight uh, about the uh, way that um, science fiction looks at and has looked at and maybe will look at uh, human computer interaction. So thank you very much, Aaron, for being here. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Nancy. If you can hear me, I hope. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm going to say hello to all of you. I'm glad to be here back at Baikai after many years. This is about my third or fourth visit over the past 30 years. And <clears throat> tonight I'm having the, uh, it's, it's a time of great uh, stress, of great challenge, of sad events in our lives outside in the, in the rest of the world. I think it's good to take a moment just to have a little entertainment and get some information about a topic that I think may be near and dear to many of you, which is the world of science fiction movies. I've been interested in them since childhood, and I'm going to review a number of them this evening in the time that's available, and I better start moving on. So the first thing I want to do Oh, I'm disabled from screen sharing. So uh, Ted or Nancy, I need to be able to screen share. Can I? Yes. Here we go. Done. Thank, Thank you. you. So I want to get rid of this uh, bar here. You should be able. Hmm. Just, just do it. Okay. You should be able to see the slides now, yes? Yes. Good. Yes. Oops. So, <clears throat> uh, my firm has been designing user interfaces for about 38 years, about 500 projects or more. Uh, Ted mentioned 37 books and 300 articles. The latest is Cuteness Engineering, which just won a Kansai Engineering Award, I believe, for a publication in Japan. We self-funded R&D projects of 10 mobile persuasion concepts. I taught over the years at uh, the Institute of Design in Chicago and College of Design and Information in Shanghai, and uh, recently donated most of my art and design work to a number of museums in the US. Here are some of the books and publications I've produced. Here's Cuteness Engineering at the lower right. And uh, I was editor in chief of UX Magazine for the Usability Professionals Association, now UXPA. And this particular issue was devoted to science fiction <clears throat> uh, in user experience design. This uh, talk originated in 2011 when I was invited to give a keynote address for Mensch und Computer in Chemnitz, Germany. Uh, a year later, I produced an ebook which I think Nancy is going to be able to make available to you later uh, uh, for downloading. And it contains the, the text version of an earlier version of this lecture. I mentioned that I've been interested in science fiction since childhood when I was interested from the age of eight or 10 in astronomy. I had a telescope and I designed rocket ship control panels in my basement so I could take imaginary flights to other planets. And saw, I read some of my first science fiction like Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. Um, science fiction as a text uh, form has been with us for hundreds if not thousands of years. Roger Bacon, wrote this text in 1260 about machines 
large ships that could move faster than rowers could row them and flying machines constructed by people and uh, to fly through the air like birds. This was a century before, or maybe uh, two centuries before Leonardo created his flying machine drawings. He himself was something of a science fiction illustrator and, and narrator of concepts. <clears throat> but it wasn't only th these two people. There are Japanese legends that treat of science fiction-like events. Plato's Republic, uh, East Indian the Ramayana from 1500 years ago. So there's a long tradition of imagining other worlds, new technology, and new societies. 50, 40 years after my first interest in science fiction, I had read about cyberpunk science, uh, science fiction writers and uh, contacted Bruce Sterling, whom some of you may know, and Baron of Inch, invited them to come to the Chi panel in 92, which was one of the most, as they said, the most popular events that Kai ever held in its first 10 years. And these science fiction writers with great uh, uh, humor and insight imagined the future of computer human technology. Uh, it was so popular that seven years later, the Kai uh, organization asked me to restage it for a second time in 1999, and I did so again with Bruce and Werner and some other speakers. Now, the taxonomy of human computer interaction covers topics like what hardware are we talking about, what software, the user community, content, and <clears throat> my favorites, metaphors, mental models, navigation, interaction, and appearance that I've written and talked about for the past 30 years. Also information visualization to help people understand complex processes. At the same time, science fiction <coughs> writers created particular genres, story narratives, their views of technology, whether it was good or bad, utopian or dystopian, and views of society, uh, a view about time, culture, also hardware, software, and media. If interlaced the HCI taxonomy with the taxonomy of science fiction, you can imagine that there's quite a lot to think about and study. Science fiction as a window or lens to look at other worlds, other dimensions, other people, but also as a mirror to look at ourselves and how we understand our role in society, how society can be formed, should be formed, will be formed. So throughout all the examples I show you, you can think about <clears throat> cultural diversity, about assumptions about users and technology, about user-centered design, uh, as Ben Schneiderman has just talked about, user-centered AI design, um, and the tools that are created inside and outside of our bodies that expand our physical and mental abilities. You can think about what fe seems futuristic, what seems retro. Are there masculine and feminine issues that emerge? Are people versus machines a friendly relation, cooperative, collaborative, or inimical? What cultural issues emerge? Again, as I asked before, and especially dear to me, information visualization issues. Now let's start our quick history. Here is one of the first science fiction movies ever created. <clears throat> and these emerged in the late 19th century, actually, in Paris. The Méliès brothers created some of the first movies, and in particular, A Trip to the Moon, which I just illustrated, showing a projectile that lands on the moon. He also did 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, as I list here. Those color films were colored by female factory workers who hand tinted every one of the frames. Some 10 or 20 years later, you have Fritz Long's classic Metropolis in 1927, the most expensive silent film ever made 
equivalent to about $200 million in today's dollars. It was a story of capitalists <clears throat> creating robots for the first time. Uh, here's one at the top right, and it's a female robot uh, that would replace workers. And there is struggle and strife between the workers versus the bosses. Uh, some of the equipment shown is very traditional process control equipment of the time in the 1920s. And the boss sits at an executive desk, rather clear of debris, uh, with a giant telephone switchboard by which he can communicate to whomever he wishes. Uh, <clears throat> quite startling is the fact that the film shows a video screen, people talking uh, through something like television sets, although television sets did not emerge into the world for 20 years. So you're looking <clears throat> at the depiction of a technology far in advance of what existed at the time. <clears throat> One of the reasons that I'm interested so much in science fiction movies is that movies have to show something in the background besides the actors. You're not looking at just a green screen. You have to show sets. You have to show rockets, robots, ray guns, scenes on other worlds, etc. So someone has to invent those. Here, a decade later is 1936, another video phone on the wall from Flash Gordon, <clears throat> a series that you may know on the left. And that screen that's shown there is not too different from what appeared um, many decades later <clears throat> in uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 movie from 1968. Flash Gordon as a series uh, was restarted in 1980 in color this time but uh, didn't have much to show in terms of HCI. In the 1940s, <clears throat> Superman saves Lois Lane in, in one of these animations that appears. <clears throat> and the, the reason it caught my attention is that it shows a flying robot with Lois hanging on for dear life. And this is in effect a drone uh, depicted in 1941. This specific movie attracted the attention of the creator of Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow from 2004 with Gwyneth Pal Paltrow and uh, Jude Law and had more modern looking robots. One of the distinguishing features about that particular film was by the way that it was the one of the first ever films created on a desktop computer. Um, so here you have again technology and vision decades before it exists. Some of you might know the day the earth stood still from 1951. It was recreated uh, some five or 10 years ago, I think, five years ago maybe with Keanu Reeves, but this is the original version <clears throat> in black and white. And <clears throat> I, I have to admit that the styling of this flying saucer and the robot and the controls inside the spaceship are extremely elegant. They're quite simple. They, they look like 1930s or 1940s glamour uh, rooms where stars can make up their faces. It's very simple. And the controls <clears throat> are rather elegant for, for the time, quite in distinction to what we see in earlier and later films. Here's an example of Forbidden Planet, one of the first science fiction movies I remember. And uh, this starred Robbie the Robot here at the lower right, one of the first times that a robot appeared with a great deal of personality. Uh, he could even brew beer inside of his internal uh, kitchen combustion unit, and uh, these, the explorers on this other planet face some dangers from uh, the advanced technology that resides deep within the planet. Um, by the way, notice these uniforms. I don't have time to show you another film called Queen of Outer Space, starring Zsa Zsa Gabor. The spacemen <clears throat> in that movie use these very same costumes. <laughs> Even though the film was made two years later by another company. Why is that? 
well, the other company didn't have a budget for a space outfit co costume. So they asked the previous film if they could borrow <laughs> the costumes from the earlier film. And amazingly, they agreed. <clears throat> Here is an unusual science fiction movie from 59, a Soviet trip to Mars, the sky is calling. The US sends also a crew to Mars and the US crew gets into trouble. A lot of the technology depicted is not very advanced, uh, e even at that time. A lot of their devices look like advanced mimeograph machines. But um, what's remarkable is the cooperation between Russia and the United States to save the US lives. And the Russians come back to the Soviet Union and are featured as heroes. There's a lot of you know, propaganda value to that event. Here's a 1968 movie, uh, Voyage to the Planet of Prehistoric Women. And um, the, some of the themes that are typical of these 1960s, 1970s films are large displays of seemingly advanced computers that may or may not be computers, probably just dials glued to a plywood panel and men in white uh, uniforms, uh, rocket ship control devices that look sort of like aircraft controls of the time. One of the startling features of this film is that the men are heavily burdened with uh, plexiglass and rubber and vinyl, metal, uh, coming to a planet of just women who don't seem to need much clothing and communicate telepathically. This distinction between heavily armored men and sort of defenseless women who communicate telepathically is a theme which we'll see in a number of science fiction movies, most notably in Avatar, which we'll come to later. George Lucas introduced the Star Wars series in 77. It was a, a tremendous increase of, of mythology and, and genre storytelling in science fiction movies uh, that, as you know, has lasted until today and yet into the future. But I have to admit, uh, there's not that much HCI invention. What he did invent was dirty rocket ships and dirty robots. They were rusty. Everything wasn't immaculate and clean as it was in the day the earth stood still in many of the other science fiction movies of the 50s and 60s. He did introduce uh, lightsabers, sort of taking us back to medieval jousting and sword fighting. And he did have a little bit of mind control of objects, but for the most part, it wasn't that inventive. The Terminator series, beginning in 84, <clears throat> starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, did have a, a fair amount of inventive HCI. Strangely, it, it took some time, effort to show what the Terminator saw uh, regarding possible targets and data and metadata about uh, these creatures and the environment, which is kind of strange, but it's a standard feature of science fiction, movie making. You have to show something to the audience so that they understand what's going on. The Terminator himself would be getting, I suppose, data feeds directly into its brain and wouldn't need displays like this, but we in the audience really appreciate them. Star Trek, <clears throat> introduced in 66, continuing in films from 79, introduced many, many innovations. For one thing, the crew itself was multi-gendered, multi-racial, and multi-species. That was a significant innovation of the time. They also introduced many devices with blinking lights and small information displays that were somewhat believable as medical devices and exploratory devices for looking <clears throat> at life on other planets. One of their more popular devices was the Star Trek communicator that they used to talk amongst themselves and to, to the ship, mother ships. In fact, this was so well known and so well liked that 
another movie called Galaxy Quest, which was kind of a spoof on Star Trek, made the their version of the Star Trek communicator one of the uh, featured uh, almost kind of uh, characters of the movie as it gets passed back and forth between alien beings and human beings. Star Trek reintroduced itself in 2013, Star Trek Into Darkness. When I first saw the movie and saw these displays, I thought, oh, this is so exciting. We'll get to see details of these medical images and whatever they're looking at to try to determine if someone is okay. No such luck. But they, <clears throat> they, they didn't have many close-ups of the displays. They did have a close-up of this woman without much clothing on. I can't remember why she had to take her clothing off, but there she was. Um, they did have transparent displays, which meant that all the information was backwards as we look at it and see it, as if that would be extremely important in the future of displays. I don't think it necessarily is, but uh, Hollywood and other movie makers thought so. In 1968, <clears throat> uh, Arthur C. Clarke working with Stanley Kubrick brought out 2001, which was a watershed movie introducing <clears throat> uh, uh, the fact that, that space has no sound. So a lot of it was just heavy breathing. Um, they did have some anomalies, some mistakes, some misguesses. They didn't know about mobile phones and still had console phones to make phone calls, which was a little bit silly. Uh, and <clears throat> the movie introduced the first HCI joke, a joke about human computer interaction. Here's one of the people on a space station, I believe, who needs to go to the bathroom and has to read through this list of uh, 12 or more instructions for how to use the toilet, which by then will be too late. Um, here's a, a meeting with no mobile phones uh, and no paper. <clears throat> Some of the displays were not so advanced looking. The information visualization was rather mundane in many cases. But they had uh, some innovations. Here's Hal looking at the two key um, astronauts reading their lips, which introduced a new capability for AI displays, AI systems. And here's an interactive uh, table with either a flat iPad kind of device or else uh, just a, a display uh, capability on the table to show news and, and imagery of friends, etc. Some of the navigation imagery is quite mundane. It's not very creative. And in fact, some of the technical display imagery, it really harks back to CAD CAM computer aided design and manufacturing displays from decades earlier. Tron in 1980. Yes. Aaron, are you willing to take a question? Uh, or would you rather hold it? Well, we started a little bit later than, <laughs> than I thought we would. I'll take one question. Yes, what is the okay. question? Okay, uh, well, Suyash, do you want to ask the question yourself? Make a brief one, okay, combined. Now you're allowed to talk. Now you can unmute. Hey, Aaron, great talk. Um, my question is, can UX design ever be classic or timeless or it does it always need to be updated. And this is also ties to like designers chasing trends and, you know, new design patterns. And uh, some people, you know, say people get bored, but some people just want to do new for novelty's sake. <clears throat> well, you've asked a very interesting and complex question. I, I believe there are, as in Christopher Alexander's study in architecture, design patterns that could be described and have been described. Uh, James Land Landry uh, in the 90s created uh, a very big book of website design patterns and uh, like the shopping cart, et cetera, et cetera, that persist uh, no matter what the technology is, is showing. In, in detail, <clears throat> but those patterns are not the design itself. It has to be realized in particularities. Those may change from time to time as we've had changes of style in 
clothing, in architecture, in music, in painting, in sculpture, in almost every aspect, in every culture uh, of what is uh, interesting form or the most current form. And there is a, a portion of, of, of our people, our human people that like the latest and newest and greatest and most creative and inventive, even if sometimes it may not be as useful in the traditional sense. Uh, so uh, you've asked a complex question. I can only give you uh, little pointers or bits of, a, of an answer that <clears throat> some things are somewhat timeless, but there will definitely be uh, 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 interest in forms which will continually change. In fact, I recall visiting an industrial design exhibit in London uh, in about the year 2000, where uh, industrial design students were trying to imagine uh, devices of the far future. And looking at any of the devices, I could not guess what any of them were. <laughs> because the the shapes, the, the, whatever were buttons or things sticking out, I had no idea what the device did. And <clears throat> you could just as well try to imagine uh, if you showed a mobile phone today to Daniel Boone from 150 years ago, is that right? 19, uh, uh, 170 years ago, maybe, would he intuit what you what the thing is what you do with it etc cetera, etc cetera. the answer in many cases would be no you'd have no idea and likewise in the future we may be uh, illiterate or unable to operate things as already happens for people today who are 80 years old trying to use the latest technology of an iPhone which for some people seems absolutely clear and easy to understand. Okay, so science fiction. Uh, <clears throat> the, the iPhone is science fiction to the 80 year old who never had one earlier. Anyway, moving on. Uh, here's Tron showing a bit of nostalgia for video games of the past. And there's one scene from uh, Tron 2, the Tron Legacy of 2010, <clears throat> in which the hero is typing on a virtual keyboard on a large screen and there is Unix programming going on in the background, which is charming and interesting, but really that's about the, the extent of uh, significant HCI in the, in the movies. Uh, there's a lightsaber, again, in a little round thing that contains all the data that people need to know. Most of the movie is motorcycle racing and action and dancing. <clears throat> One of my favorite movies is Brazil. I don't know if you know this from 1985, Terry Gilliam, who has <coughs> made many, many riotous comedies, also created uh, this dystopian image of the future with devices that are overly complicated and inhumane in a government bureaucratic controlled 1984-ish uh, dystopia. And look at all the wires and things to plug into your phone. Uh, here's the hero. He eventually goes crazy and it ends badly. He's in love with this lady at the lower left. And it's a wonderful, whimsical romance, but told in a very dark and <laughs> miserable <laughs> story. Um, here's Total Recall, which was quite creative. Uh, it was a uh, Philip K. Dick a uh, short story that <clears throat> was turned into a movie. It had lots of consumerish, everyday uh, HCI and, and CGI depictions. Here's a scene of an artificial window. If you don't like that view of the lake, you can switch it to something else. Gigantic x-ray machines. Here's a uh, the pseudo wife of the hero playing um, virtual tennis with a coach maybe. Uh, and here's Arnold uh, putting on some kind of 3D uh, you know, fleshy mask around his face. But a lot of the movie is sort of hardcore gray, blue, heavy duty, you know, high tech military tech looking environments and machines that look quite inhumane. <clears throat> including Arnold having to pull a sensor out of his left nostril 
which uh, is probably disgusting for some people. Um, in the movie, there is another bit of humor, HCI humor. Here's Arnold checking into the Hilton on Mars, decades into the future. Uh, and he got there with very advanced technology. And he's checking in, but notice this uh, hotel screen is a 24 line, 80 character display, ASCII screen. In this year, hard to believe. And I think it was intended as kind of a joke. In the remake of Total Recall from 2012, <clears throat> a much different storytelling um, and a lot of different uh, technology. They have a phone system built into a little bit of uh, uh, silicon and wires embedded into the wrist of the, uh, the hero, I think, at the right. And if you put your hand on a piece of glass, ba-boom, uh, the display and the controls appear magically. Um, Unfortunately, there comes a moment when he, he has to get rid of that phone, and so he has to dig the device out of his own wrist, which is rather horrible. Uh, here's the Matrix trilogy from 1999 to 2003. Uh, very innovative <clears throat> in its storytelling. It included little pills that will send you into other dimensions. Uh, it featured this famous falling letters uh, depiction of something that's magical, mystical, and <laughs> somewhat meaningless. Um, a lot of dark, uh, dreary, uh, uh, foreboding uh, imagery of, of the technology of both the heroes and the villains. Uh, sometimes countered by completely empty spaces like this, which are dramatically white and different from everything else. Notice this fellow here is uh, one of the hero people looking at about a dozen screens. And by the way, he's at least six feet from any of those monitors or displays. Can he read anything on any of those displays? Uh, probably not. Uh, at about the same time, Bloomberg showed this design <clears throat> from a real multi uh, six uh, screen display for looking at stock market uh, data. And it was published in UX Magazine and a lot of effort went into being able to give one <clears throat> viewer uh, appropriate uh, data for decision-making. <clears throat> Here's another strange movie called Existence. Some of you may know it. Um, it is unusual in many ways. First of all, it features biomorphic uh, devices that look like pieces of flesh, umbilical cords, and so on. And um, if you want to communicate <clears throat> with uh, the levels of reality in this movie, you have to get something inserted directly into your spine uh, so that you can communicate. In fact, you have to uh, shove this into your spine. One of the more memorable uh, moments in the movie <clears throat> is when the hero is now about two levels deep into dreams or fantasies or games. He's in a restaurant. Uh, he eats a dinner and notices that there are bones on his plate. He pushes the bones together and, and constructs a pistol and uses the teeth from the animal that he was eating and shoves them into the pistol and shoots and kills the waiter. Bet you didn't expect that in a restaurant scene. Um, <clears throat> this is a famous iconic image of, uh, of uh, direct man manipulation of imagery with hands outstretched. And our hero uh, is going to do that six to eight hours a day and somehow not be magically exhausted. A lot of his manipulation of imagery is just moving photographs left and right, up and down. It's not very complex. There is some <clears throat> depiction of virtual creatures, uh, transparent displays, large screen displays, but uh, make it uh, state of the art for 2002. In fact, Samsung showed transparent 
windows in CES of 2012, in which you could look through into the next room <clears throat> or make it <clears throat> completely information displays for yourself or make it show a Venetian blind and change the blinds to close them. Here's one you may or may not know called Eon Flux from 2005. One of the few of these uh, science fiction movies to be directed by a woman. Uh, it shows some innovations like maps or guides that appear on your own forearm when the skin is suddenly forced to raise itself a little bit into sort of a braille-like depiction of how to guide yourself through the corridors. Uh, here, uh, <clears throat> a man transfers a pill to the mouth of the heroine uh, to take her into another dimensional world of fantasy where she can meet the other people in her group who are trying to revolt against the people controlling the world. <clears throat> she has had one of her eyes replaced by a camera. She sends little sensors by throwing them out onto the floor. <clears throat> they roll around and gather information. And in a very unusual HCI technique, in order to bring them back to her, she whistles and they all return like little obedient puppies. Here's ultraviolet a year later <clears throat> that shows the year 2078. That's not too far from where we are now, uh, including such things as throwaway paper phones that you buy at a little vending stand. One of the moments in the display, <clears throat> in the movie, is a full screen image of this information visualization as a guide to what's in the building. And it's, it's simply unusual and, and, and glorious in a way uh, for showing so much detail <clears throat> and, and thinking that goes into some information display like this. Notice that the writing uh, is perhaps unreadable. Maybe that's a two and a three. I don't know what that is. <clears throat> and that's because by that time in 2078, uh, the, what left of the world has changed its writing system to be so different that we can't read it anymore. Here's a funny movie, a funny science fiction movie. The entire thing is a comedy <clears throat> called Idiocracy by Mike Judge, whom you may know from other television and film comedies. In this stage and 500 years from now, <clears throat> a hero who has been put into some kind of a, a magic coffin for the military accidentally is forgotten for 500 years and wakes up and discovers, even though he was very average, he's now the smartest man on earth because everyone else has become dumber, dumber, and dumber. No one can read anymore. <clears throat> People in a medical facility have to look at little pictograms to try to understand what might be wrong with someone. Fox News shows semi-nude or completely nude television <clears throat> news presenters. Here's the entertainment uh, exposed to this typical consumer. And here's the president of the United States with a machine gun quieting Congress uh, by getting their attention by firing that into the ceiling. Not a happy picture, but incredibly funny. Avatar from 2009, I'm sure you know, <clears throat> features once again, men in heavy metal against women uh, who don't need much clothing and who communicate telepathically. Uh, differences of color are startling. Here, the typical transparent displays. This is the word avatar backwards and <clears throat> impressive three-dimensional navigation systems to help guide people uh, who are trying to uh, control the, the planet of Pandora to get hold of unobtainium, which is a rather ridiculous name for a substance. I don't know if you're familiar with District 9, but it is a fine science fiction film uh, dealing with uh, <clears throat> creatures from another planet who get stuck in their spaceship above Johannesburg. Some of them come down to Earth and are trapped by human beings, put into camps, isolated, 
just like blacks were in apartheid South Africa. So there are many, many uh, uh, references and issues uh, of, of uh, what to do with alien beings. Uh, this one man happens to be originally very much against the aliens, but gets uh, injured and starts to take some alien blood into his body and begins to transform into one of the aliens um, and changes his mind about the creatures. He amazingly can fit into one of their rocket ships in their control uh, cockpit seat and control the, the machine, which amazingly can support a human being as well as these strange creatures. That gives new meaning to user-centered design, which is able to uh, account for alien uh, HCI as well. One of the most beautiful moments in the film is when the alien creature <clears throat> flies his own or its own uh, ship for a while and manipulates the controls with about three fingers, I think, or appendages, the dance of the, the movement of that creature is so powerful, so beautiful. A little moment of ballet of, of fingers flying around screens. It puts Tom Cruise's waving of hands in Minority Report to shame. Um, and some people have asked, why don't I show movie clips from all these? We'd never have time. Also, the movie studios might be even more upset uh, at my <clears throat> uh, taking movie clips. And, and you have to remember that the HCI uh, uh, focused moments in these films are generally two or three minutes out of 120 minutes or 150 minutes. <clears throat> so it, it's, it's very hard to look for and select. I, I've looked at a lot of movies and found just the scenes that I needed and could easily capture them with screen grabs. Here is Prometheus by Ridley, director Ridley Scott, who did Aliens, creating in 2012 a, a kind of a new science fiction type because although he has fantastic uh, CGI displays of uh, astronomical data, he also built his own sets. These are not CGI. They are actually constructed, including these strange kind of soft boiled egg displays that people are supposed to touch or squeeze, <clears throat> strange things to move around. And uh, this, uh, this AI creature who knows all the languages of Earth uh, manages to figure out how to, uh, to use them. So <clears throat> it has many beautiful and ingenious UX moments, strange spherical and bulbous buttons, and uh, real sets. Here's um, a magnificent large display, <clears throat> uh, sort of going far beyond whatever else we've seen in, in other displays. And this is from Oblivion in 2013. Again, a Tom Cruise movie. What's special about it is that uh, th this large display here and moments of interacting with it are quite significant. They, they show a lot of touching of the buttons and uh, moving, changing controls and <clears throat> looking at details of the display. And if, if your eye is uh, attentive, you can sort of look at what else are they showing there? And does that seem realistic? And why did they pick that? So they kind of open themselves up to criticism. Uh, the, the user interface is, a, as I point out in this bullet, is a kind of central character in the movie, along with the people. <clears throat> in other recent movies, exoskeletons uh, go crazy. Pacific Rim features them. Uh, Guillermo del Toro is, has created wonderful fantasy movies. And here in Pacific Rim, giant uh, kind of creatures with a human being or two human beings actually inside controlling them. <clears throat> the uh, it, very elaborate uh, three-dimensional virtual displays of controls. Uh, you'd have to look at these for hours to figure out what they might be showing. And, and what, what seems to be happening beginning in about 2013, 2014 is that 
user experience design, HCI design and sci-fi seems to be really growing up. They're just so complex, much more than the past. Here's another Tom Cruise movie, Edge of Tomorrow with exoskeletons as a new high-tech Hollywood toy. And uh, they are impressive. Uh, you, know, it's a, you, you could do just a study of science fiction movies of exoskeletons, or you could do a science fiction study of just <clears throat> the history of robots or AI agents or systems as shown in Ex Machina. And interestingly in Ex Machina, the AI system uh, eventually gets bored and, and, and annoyed with human beings, kills its creator, if I recall, and heads off into regular society. <coughs> the same thing happens with the movie called Her, which is just a voice agent. There's no visual display other than a little kind of uh, uh, mobile phone in the pocket. Martian from 2015 <clears throat> is a very good science and science fiction movie with many scenes of data displays, controls, very convincing, <clears throat> in its uh, scientific uh, accuracy and the and the kind of interaction which would be uh, required. Arrival of 2016 also shows some very good science, especially with sign making and interpretation of an alien, I think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, appendage creature which writes in a way totally different than anything that we would expect. <clears throat> and the heroine of the movie has to figure out how to interpret these blops that are actual writing and communication from the alien society. It's really quite marvelous. Black Panther of 2018 <clears throat> was innovative and important in giving African-American, African theme and culture its moment in science fiction movie history. It was good in many, many ways. It was not particularly, uh, didn't go far in HCI innovation, except for some uh, creative uh, uh, depiction of writing and language, but most of the displays were something that one might expect, but lots of great costumes and scenery. <clears throat> in Justice League in 2018, we're getting more now a, a new phenomenon, which is non-physical HCIs that, that just pop into space, I don't even know how, in this case, between the two hands of this person, so that the person can communicate and look at uh, videos and, and, and information displays. Westworld, now on TV, from 2016 to 18, shows detailed user interface scenes. Many of them, this is uh, a recreation of the Westworld movie from 1973, Three, I think from Yule Brenner, <clears throat> but that movie never had what this shows. Incredibly detailed moments. If you could stop the movie, you could look over here and, and read the text of all the AI cognitive engineering and other controls that are adjusting the behavior of robots, the dialogues, the interactions with human beings, etc. It is very impressive, I would say. Also on HBO is Electric Dreams, uh, 10 uh, Philip K. Dick short stories that are turned into uh, each of them about an hour, I think. And <clears throat> they show many innovative uh, moments of HCI depiction, including again, elaborate uh, I don't know what to call them, virtual pop-ups out of uh, a wristband display where people can see other people, see data, interact, and change the course of human history by how they interact by touching or adjusting this virtual display. Here's another one, a stick that suddenly has a pop-out uh, display surface. Again, I have no idea how this could be realized. On the other hand, here's a uh, depiction of a uh, sort of a, a scan or a slit of, of light that, that falls down onto a desk. And the person here can see a display and read all kinds of information and interact with a computer system. Well, in fact, uh, 
I believe it was Ericsson or Siemens uh, 20, 15, 20 years ago who had systems like this that could create uh, imagery on desks. I think it's been forgotten for a long time, but was found and, and developed further. Another series on Netflix is Altered Carbon, again, <clears throat> with many detailed UI uh, uh, scenes. And the movies are taking the time, or, or, or the, the video creators are taking the time to work out likely contents for all of the controls and options uh, and data that would be depicted. They do have some other tip, more typical rectangular uh, work screens, let's say. And here again, is some kind of pop-up uh, technology depiction of something if someone wants to see some detailed blueprints. So my guess is that some researchers may see this kind of imagery and figure out how could we actually do something like that. Avenue 5 <coughs> uh, from uh, this year shows vast uh, UI and control room depictions uh, transparent uh, panels, but also uh, these kind of devices and, and wraparound imagery on the wrist, which are something more like consumer oriented, not your rocket ship control panel kinds of imagery. Uh, robots and AI agents have been depicted for decades. <clears throat> and as I said, again, this could be a study itself of what the movies have done with these uh, creatures. In 2018, Ready Player One showed virtual worlds, games, and kind of a very mature uh, HCI world in which people were popping up uh, wraparound displays uh, in, in all kinds of circumstances of a game-like uh, environment, <clears throat> and all of it was sort of taken for granted from the game world. In many ways, as I've said, HCI has gone from the classic world, the immature world, to the Baroque and Rococo world, <laughs> and now is just part and parcel of many of these television displays. It's not a minor character in the background. These are uh, massively complex, seemingly meaningful and important in the storytelling. <coughs> now, it's not only Hollywood that has created visions of the future. Some of you may remember Apple's Knowledge Navigator from 1992. Uh, I have a scene of that in which a caricature of Steve Jobs was uh, answering questions and reporting back to you in ways that some people criticized because Apple was using this kind of imagery in its ads saying, oh, look at what we're doing. We're gonna bring you the future. And, and, and natural language uh, researchers said, this is ridiculous. You won't be able to do this for 20 years. And guess what? It did take 20 years before we had Siri. <clears throat> Um, the Department of Defense uh, made uh, scenarios that they showed uh, equipment that could be put around the head that would scan the eyes and feed imagery to the eyes and to the ears and could detect when a brain was overloaded and shift from one medium or one sense to another sense in order to give decision makers in war rooms <clears throat> better cognitive uh, uh, augmentation uh, for decision making. Industry has done some of its own science fiction fantasy making. Other cultures as well. I mentioned that at the beginning. <clears throat> and one could look at cross-cultural trends in science fiction movies <clears throat> and the approaches to technology. That would be another study for another time. Um, just to show you, here's a, one of three screenfuls of a list of science fiction films since 1952 in India, which is, you know, it produces 
Indian, so-called classic Indian movies that I saw in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, <clears throat> but also the Bollywood favorites of today. And in fact, there is a Bollywood uh, 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 science fiction movie. Um, it's also the case, please notice that <clears throat> there are many languages in use in India. There are about 11 or so nas national languages. So many of the films <clears throat> are produced in different languages. More recently, uh, I saw on United Airlines, the movie 2.0, which was the most expensive Indian film made. It's a science fiction movie. It's a fantasy plot in which all the phones of the world fly away and are collected somewhere. <clears throat> and there are evil spirits and somehow it ends happily uh, with Bollywood dancing and lots of singing. Here are some scenes from the movie. This is a robot <clears throat> who looks just like a human being, makes it easy to depict. There are the typical complex blue oriented displays of augmented reality over the scenes of the real world. And uh, what is perhaps unique in Indian science fiction movie making, some kinds of uh, evil uh, uh, spiritual creatures which uh, endanger the world. And in the end, uh, this hero and maybe a sidekick robot, I can't remember who she is, dance away uh, through their victory over the evil forces and everything turns out fine. In China, <clears throat> uh, Jules Verne was imported during the late 19th and early 20th. Uh, Zheng Wenguang uh, is the father of Chinese sci-fi who wrote in the 50s. And Tong Enzheng wrote Death Ray on a Coral Island, which was China's first science fiction movie of 1980. So happens I have a few scenes from that movie. And you can see, this is 1980, uh, people in white uh, lab coats uh, lots of big uh, numerical displays and things that look quite out of date. And here's an old style telephone. <clears throat> yeah, but there are some video screens and a few other uh, images of the future. Japan has produced lots of movies of sci-fi fantasy, including the Godzilla ones. I don't have time to even go through all of these. <clears throat> That's just a selection. <clears throat> but they have been shown and known for decades. So some closing thoughts since time is almost uh, done. Uh, Sci-fi media and literature have innovated and inspired some HCI innovations. In the past, HCI was usually a minor part of the storytelling, <clears throat> but has expanded in, in recent uh, years. There is a lot of material here which some of you, I hope, will take as PhD theses or research aspects for some papers <clears throat> and can be looked at. I haven't looked at anime, at manga and games. I haven't looked at kids, sci-fi. There are many, many other issues that could be explored. I've just had time to look at a few of the mainstream science fiction uh, materials. <clears throat> more and more papers are appearing in conferences. There are more courses in speculative fiction. And uh, a lot of people are looking at science fiction as a factor in science, uh, science fiction and science fact. A recent interactions article uh, issue uh, devoted itself to uh, sci-fi innovation. Uh, the possibility of Afrofuturism <coughs> and, and uh, science fiction as design explorations. Okay, that's what I have to say in the time available. Wait a minute. I'm back here. Hello. And before I go, I want to uh, call your attention to just two uh, books that have appeared recently. This one on the, on, let's see, is it on your right? I think so. Fantastic Planets, Forbidden Zones, and Lost Continents. 100 science fiction films, the best. And with a lot of detailed information about the production, uh, background stories, etc. 
uh, this book was published by Springer, I think last year, and is science fiction by scientists. And um, each chapter of the book is by a different author and takes a specific theme like uh, uh, DNA and genetic engineering, AI systems, etc., and brings them <clears throat> into a, a story which is not so much about characters and character interaction, but about the concepts of the themes. Now, I wanted to do one final screen share. And that is- I did put the link for each of those books into the Excellent. chat. Thank you. thank you, thank you. And here's this, but what I want to do is go over here. Yeah, hopefully you can see these multicolored images. They're from an exhibit called Cowboys in Space, which took place in August of last year in Austin, Texas. <clears throat> and uh, the exhibit was unlike anything I've really ever seen in an exhibit. It was all about science fiction uh, with some of our favorite characters going back decades. And uh, some of the real equipment that was used in the movies and some comparisons between the movies themselves and the genre of cowboys and Western storytelling. And that itself, you know, so you can see here, sort of a gunslinger, gunslinger, gunslinger <clears throat> outfits and, and positions. And you realize, well, yeah, uh, Star, Tra Star Wars uh, characters did engage in a kind of uh, bounty hunting and, and so on. And there is a quote here that George Lucas uh, said, if, uh, if, uh, if I want, oh, here it is. I was thinking mythologically, should Han Solo be a cowboy or should he be John Wayne? And I said, yeah, he should be John Wayne. So <clears throat> there's a fair amount of insight into comparing uh, all of what science fiction movies have produced for the past 40 years in Westerns. <clears throat> and I have these photos and I, if you send me your email with just the word Beikai in the, in the subject line, I will know to add your email address to the list of uh, <clears throat> people who will have access to the Google album showing all of these images if you're interested in it. And as an added bonus, the time is limited, I will send you the full uh, science fiction, here's the Melies image. I'll send <clears throat> the science fiction uh, slideshow, which is twice as long, <clears throat> if you can stand it, that shows uh, other movies and other images from these movies. Thanks very much for your attention. I'm glad I could join with you today. So um, Aaron, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is, a, a, I just want to say, a, um, a fantastic uh, and, and thoughtful uh, talk, especially uh, enjoyable was all the scholarship and the even way you brought out something special about each of, the, each of these um, vi uh, movies that you showed. Um, now I think we want to um, uh, ask, yeah. I'll, I'll ask one question. And then we'll let uh, other people ask questions. So mm -hmm. my, my question is, as I'm as I, there, you really brought us to the brink of what what else could be. And uh, in my life, I think feedback. Um, and when I was reflecting on feedback, I kind of thought of a user interface joke in 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, where um, uh, the feedback is, I can't do that. <laughs> But do you have any other statement about feedback that you could think that you want to think about? <clears throat> well, can you hear me now? Oh yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, novels are so much better than printed text in displaying thoughts and concepts. Movies are all about action, reaction, etc. So they're two different worlds, and they have two different qualities and benefits and abilities. I will say that <clears throat> much of what we see in the movies is, is kind of a, a pale 
version, a, a movie version of reality. Just like human reactions, human situations in the real world are depicted in a stylized version in most movies. It's rare that you can get the feeling, oh my gosh, that's exactly how it would be for me. <clears throat> so a, a lot of the feedback, even a lot of the original action and then interaction is going to be stylized because that's what's efficient and effective for fast movie making. Otherwise, you might drown in all of the details. So, um, okay, good, thank you. Nancy, do you have some more questions that have come over yes. that um, you wanna put forward, please? Sure, I'd like to share Dave Galby's uh, uh, question and he's interested in what features of web UX do you think will still be in use in a hundred years? <laughs> Hundred, well, that's a good one. Oh my gosh! I... <laughs> well, I, I, to tell you the truth, <laughs> Ver, Werner Vinge, I think, already commented on this. I have two comments to make. Werner Vinge in the in the science fiction novel called True Names. I yep. don't know if any of you know it, but it's a fantastic True Names. Werner Vinge, V I N G E. Uh, he was a mathematician at UC San Diego, I think. <clears throat> and he envisioned this future uh, like the early uh, uh, writers of cyberpunk science fiction of direct brain computer connections. So uh, in communicating with other people, you could appear as anything you wanted to with levels of complexity in all of that. And the interactions would all take place uh, mentally in, <clears throat> in a fabricated fantasy space. So you didn't have the kind of devices, the clumsy things of websites and telephone screens, etc., that we have now. I'm reminded also of a comment made, I think, somewhat provocatively by Jaron Lanier. Um, a friend Never of, provocative, Jaron. <laughs> no. Who lives about seven minutes from me here in Berkeley. And uh, <clears throat> he said, I, I mean, I think I met him on the street walking around and we were talking and he said, you know, uh, you know, you're involved with user interface design, but in the future, there will be no user interfaces because all of it will be a sort of direct connection. And in a way, I, I had trouble understanding what he might mean because the nature of a direct uh, stimulus to ourselves is something like, if I put a lighted match under my palm, uh, you know that I will sense that there's something there. There's a <clears throat> direct sensory reaction to outside stimulus. Everything else that we do as human beings is communication. And I mean, communication takes place through stylized sign and symbol systems. That's the world of semiotics. <clears throat> and what Werner Vinge was writing about was the most elaborate <clears throat> form of the sign and symbol communication that you could concoct in the human mind and it could go directly from you to someone else. So, um, thank you for that one. Let me, let me give you one more question that we've got uh, queued up here. And that is, you've given us a terrific number of, from a hundred years of film. How, what, what couple of films or shows would you recommend out of your big long list to help people uh, get inspiration for futuristic HCI interfaces? Good question. <clears throat> uh, someone just texted me, I don't forget who it came from, that I forgot Dick Tracy and his uh, talking Mystery. watch. Yep. Um, but I, I didn't focus on comic books and comics and manga, etc. just standard movies. Um, as for the ones that might 
help to envision soon to be future? Uh, well, actually, you gave a pretty good expose of, of reasons for and values from about 50 movies just now. So it's uh, well, but they're asking for, you know, five to get started for the future. And I, I'd have to say uh, you, you, a few a few recent classics, um, um, you know, which I, I mean, Total Recall uh, was inventive in a, in a number of ways, and maybe you could look and see how they invented. Uh, but also these uh, uh, Netflix and HBO series, especially Philip K. Dick's short stories, are, have spent so much time and money on thinking about special effects that that might be a, a good place to start. Also Westworld. <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to focus on just consumer TV, but, 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 but they are rather impressive as a mature yeah. Yeah. development of HCI. Uh, consumer TV has been fighting hard to get better and better. Yep, yep. Um, I, think, uh, I think we've had um, quite gonna... a good talk, and I don't know if we need one more uh, question, but I think we've we... Got... We got one more person who's kind of queued up, and I'm going to recognize them okay. to talk for themselves. So I think it's Smita. Okay. You, you're talking as permitted. I'm going to unmute you. Why don't you ask your question, Smita? Sorry, I was muted, and I was having dinner, but uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm on the spot now. But um, okay, you are. <laughs> Sorry, <coughs> All I my fault. You can blame me. Well, um, first of all, I love sci-fi. I read all kinds of novels. I'm like obsessed with TV shows. And one thing I can't help wondering is when you watch a lot of this stuff, it feels like all the um, best technology and the most secure access to that technology usually is available to the wealthy. And I can't help but wondering if that ends up becoming a commodity, right? That will increase the gap between people. Very good point. Uh, <clears throat> I think if we're not careful, it will certainly be so. And uh, therefore, uh, um, I would say important for us to think about what women have, women have and can contribute to sci-fi, movies and ideas and expressions that they haven't had a chance to do as much because of the circumstances of the past. Um, indigenous, I mean, Black, uh, Black Panther, Afrofuturism or Middle East futurism is important to think out and develop. And stories about the less privileged and the less wealthy, the less educated, trying to cope with this technology and to keep it from ruining their lives that would also be important to sort out and to try to depict and to treat and respect. Thank you. There was, there was a comment in, in the chat where um, Kirill Grouchnikov mentioned a um, website called experienceperception.com that has a whole uh, issue about Black Panthers and Wakanda technical design. So people can go ahead and look at that. That's great to know. Um, oh, back to you, Ted. Okay, yeah, well, I just wanna say that I, uh, this, this uh, Aaron was one of our most successful meetings, probably the high watermark of number of people um, at uh, well over a hundred people were watching us, uh, watching you this evening. And uh, I think that, um, our next, our next meeting is, um, uh, that is, um, is going to be announced by Nancy. Um, I'm not sure if she's ready to announce it yet. She's um, not ready to announce it yet. I want to August, confirm everybody before I offer it. <laughs> August, I believe we're going to have um, uh, Barbara Tversky, Barbara Tversky who uh, has written a fabulous book and has a great talk about it. Uh, her, her husband was the, the famous um, psychologist 
Amos Tversky, and they both were fantastic. Uh, they're both fantastic psychologists. So um, everybody, I'm really um, excited about this coming year um, as a really good place for us to meet. We are thinking of possibly uh, meeting um, an hour earlier to allow people from the East Coast to be part of it. Uh, so we might we might change it to 6:30. And uh, in the meantime, uh, look forward to um, to invitations to the uh, the Beikai summer party, which will be virtual. Um, and uh, please think of uh, being a Beikai uh, uh, experience uh, creator, a uh, volunteer. And um, we look forward to seeing you next month. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Lots of thank yous and interesting comments. Thanks, uh, Greg and Jaime for mentioning that you could attend at a distance, whether yeah. that distance is uh, San Francisco or Atlanta. So, and I noticed there was somebody else on from Detroit earlier. Thank you all for showing up. Okay, anybody wanna have the last word? I wanna say that I, I'm sorry I couldn't respond to chat messages. It was too complex and diverting for me. <laughs> uh, you, we probably shouldn't have exposed you to a a very, very general, very important question in the, that was on on AI, UAI in general in the middle of your talk, but you you handled that and uh, we appreciate it. And I think people appreciated that answer too. Thanks everyone. So uh, with that, the formal meeting is adjourned and I don't know if people want to continue chatting. I don't know. Uh, um, we could stop the recording and we could ask, invite people to uh, participate. Oh, I, 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 I want to say at the end, don't forget to send me an email message just with Beikai in the subject line if you want to get the uh, full slideshow and the exhibit. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. And I, I put your address in the chat. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>